Okay, thank you, Mathilde, and uh, welcome to all of you in Les Ouches. Uh, I'm, of course, very pleased and very honored to give the introductory lecture to this session. Uh, Les Ouches, you will discover, uh, is quite a magnificent place with a long history, dating back to the early 50s when Cécile de Witt started in the barn, <coughs> which is now the restaurant, a, a summer school in which Pauli, Wigner, Weisskopf, uh, Fermi were lecturing. Uh, they say that the, the, the level of the teachers has slowly gone down uh, along the years. And it's also a place in the story. For instance, this, this, this stick there has been engraved with the first names of the participants in the 1990 Fundamental Systems in Quantum Optics, Les Ouches School. And you can recognize Klaus Melmer and a few others who engraved this stick, so things last in Les Ouches. Okay, so I'm supposed to speak of field quantization and cavity QED, but perhaps I will start with a few, a few historical notes about atom and matter, uh, light and matter interaction. Very clearly, light and matter has been at the heart of the scientific crisis which led to quantum physics. Uh, at the time of Lord Kelvin, in the end of the 19, we had these three pillars, mechanics, thermodynamics, electromagnetism, which seem to explain all of the world, but two small problems, two little clouds on the clear skies of physics, as Lord Kelvin pointed out. The ether problem, which is the relativity of the velocity of light, and the black body radiation. How do heated bodies emit light? And he could have added the atomic spectra. And as you all know, these three little clouds turned into big thunderstorm that washed out all of classical physics eventually leading in the late 20s to the advent of quantum mechanics as we know it. And it's, it's a quite remarkable scientific revolution. It's an impressive success, as we will see a bit later. The, but the theory has many counterintuitive features. Quantum world is obviously a world of cats dead and alive, the doors open and closed at the same time, which, of course, are very far from our understanding of nature, which means that contrary to many other physical theories, you need an interpretation. You need an interpretation layer between the formalism, the mathematical formalism, and your understanding of the world. But these few guys, Schrodinger, Bohr, Heisenberg, really have changed our understanding of the world. And this led to very remarkable consequences, to very remarkable successes, first in the field of physics. Now quantum physics applies from the superstrings I don't know exactly what a superstring can be, but maybe some of you know, at, at a very small scale, the Planck scale, to the elementary particle, to the cosmological structure, the black body radiation map is a scar of the quantum fluctuations of the early universe, at least we believe, and of course, through what will be the center of a school, the atoms, molecules, and solids. It's an extremely precise theory. We can compute things with 12 significant digits, we can now measure them, we can compare and the digits are the same, which is quite outstanding. And it's a universal theoretical frame, there is only one interaction that still resists the invader, which is gravitation, at least strong gravitation. It's also important to point out that quantum physics has had many applications. The lasers are a direct consequence of quantum physics. Of course, it's not only laser pointers, but it's everything that is behind the internet communication. The clocks, we will most probably discuss that in a car paid uh, talks, the clocks now have a precision which is outstanding one second over the age of the universe. That, that's really unthinkable. One centimeter gravitational redshift. Solid state physics, of course, this computer relies on the quantum physics of, of current flows in semiconductors. Nuclear magnetic re uh, imaging, which is a beautiful combination of quantum technology, superconducting magnets, NMR, the dense of spins in magnetic field, and a lot of computing power to reconstruct the image. And with that, we have won something like 10 years of life expectancy. This is a notion I'm very sensitive to nowadays. So these applications had a considerable societal and economic impact. And a large part of the gross product, as the economists would say, of the modern societies directly emerged from techniques that derived from our quantum understanding of the world. And I think that should be noticed. 
It's an astounding impact, uh, an astounding example of impact of curiosity-driven blue sky research. Those guys in the 20s wanted to understand the atomic structure. They ended up changing the society. And I think it's, it's a beautiful illustration of two things about science. I wish political deciders would be in the room, but I guess it's not the case, and I'm just trying to convince people who are already convinced of that. Science needs time. It's a century or half a century between the theory and the application. And science needs freedom. Don't look under the light source. Go elsewhere. Go in the dark and explore. So it's a message for you for the future. So what we will discuss in the school is about atoms and light. Well, cold atoms and light, because no atoms are cold, but in the early times they were hot, and still it was an interesting problem to understand how atoms and light interact. They played, as I said, a very initial role in the, in, in the creation of quantum physics, but they continue to do so, both on a conceptual and experimental level. On the conceptual level, for instance, the problem of the divergences that arise, we will go to that later, when you compute some atomic characteristics in the presence of a quantized radiation field, led to the problem, to, to, to the techniques of renormalization, and basically to everything that is modern, quantum electrodynamics and standard model. On an experimental level, along the years, it's deep, more and more technological development has arisen which allow us to manipulate more precisely and more carefully atoms with light. And those periodic technological breakthroughs led to periodic revivals of AMO physics. AMO physics is a bit like a phoenix. It has been told dead for regularly, about every 10 years. People say that that's over. Everything that's really interesting has been made. And suddenly a guy came and said, but what if? And then AMO physics revived. And I would like to, to, to skip very rapidly through these developments just to, to, to give you an insight. If you want more details, I recommend the Serge Arroche lecture note in Collège de France, year 2015, where I made a survey of 50 years of atomic physics. Of course, if you have questions, feel free to, to ask. Uh, we will cover what we can cover, uh, and, uh, and uh, so you can interrupt at any time. So I would say that the onset of modern atomic physics is Rabi experiments, shortly before the war, where I could, on an atomic beam focused with magnets, example magnets, where I could observe a transition between two internal levels of an atom driven by a radio frequency. <coughs> it's really one of his first experiments. He discovered the Rabi oscillation phenomenon, and it's still, of course, a key ingredient in AMO experiments. Shortly after, shortly after the war, 10 years after, uh, Ramsey supplemented the idea by going to two separate interaction zones with the same atom. This is the celebrated Ramsey interference method, which is, of course, a key to precision spectroscopy. You can see this beautiful atomic clock signal here. I think it originates from CIRT. Uh, it's a fountain experiment. It's also an example of controlled quantum interference of quantum interferometry, and uh, of course, a very powerful spectroscopic uh, tool. And we'll say much more on Ramsey fringes. Of course, these developments were to a large extent driven by the availability of radio frequency sources uh, due to the radar research during World War II. There are very bad things about war, and but a few positive offspring. At the same time, and with the same techniques, Bloch and Purcell, discover nuclear magnetic resonance. How you can manipulate the nuclear spins in magnetic fields with radio frequencies. This is, these are the sketch of your two experiments. And that, of course, led to beautiful developments. The NMR spectrometers of nowadays are a mandatory tool for chemical research. You can basically unfold the structure of a whole protein by looking at the dent of a spin. And people say, yes, that's OK. Atomic physics is, has reached an apex and can only decay now. But Brossel and Bitter came, Jean Brossel and Bitter, and discovered the double resonance phenomenon. That you can study the radio frequency resonances between levels in an atom by looking at the light the atom emits. 
which makes very compact and very simple experiments, and which is also a harbinger of the optical pumping techniques, which came with Kessler and Brossel about at the same time. The optical pumping is basically the idea that you can manipulate the internal angular momentum of an atom with a polarization of light. It's a beautiful example because it's the really first time you can create a totally out of equilibrium situation in which you put all of the atomic population in one level and not in the mixture that is just Boltzmann equilibrium. And it's also, of course, a key ingredient for atomic physics. I think we will discuss that in the laser cooling uh, uh, lectures. And very beautifully, Kassler made a small footnote in one of his papers, the effet lumino frigorique, which is the idea that instead of exchanging angular momentum, you could perhaps exchange momentum. And you could perhaps use light to cool atoms. That was in the 50s, 30 years before the real first uh, atomic cooling experiment. And so that, that was it, optical pumping became. And so people were saying, OK, atomic physics has reached an apex, and now it should decay into engineering problems. And then the laser came. The laser came with tones, with Gordon, with Shallow, with Mayman, Ruby laser, with Ali Javan, the helium neon laser. And suddenly, instead of lamps that were few, giving a few broadband photons a year, you had these lasers, which are infinitely narrow, infinitely powerful. And suddenly, a whole realm of experiments opened to atomic physics. And of course, this also allowed us to enter the digital communication age. And people say it's magnificent, but no laser is a bit of engineering, and atomic physics is decaying, and there is nothing more to find in laser. No. There is nonlinear optics. With Franken, Bloombergen, how can you generate harmonics? This green laser is in fact infrared, but there is in the cavity of this chip a tiny crystal that doubles the frequency. Bordet and Hall came with the idea of saturated absorption which is yet another nonlinear effect at the atomic scale, and which provides extremely precise spectroscopy. Grimbert, Kanyak, and Shebotayev, I couldn't find a picture of Shebotayev. I'm very sorry for that. So Grimbert and Kanyak, Kanyak passed away a, a few months ago, invented two photon Doppler free spectroscopy, which again opened a full new realm of spectroscopic research. So it was still li lively, but people said, well, okay, now we have a spectroscopic tool, we just need to take all the lines of all the elements and atomic physics is dead. No, because in the 80, we got more control on individual quantum particles. Th this was the advent of a real experiment on laser cooling, far after Kessler's suggestion of the effet lumino -frigoric. At the same time, Wineland, Toshek, and others developed the ion trap technology and I remember my amazement, I'm old enough for that, when I saw the first PRL paper with a picture of a single ion. You see a tiny spot on the picture. Well, it's very tiny indeed. You see a tiny spot and this is a single ion. And you can even see bl it blinking in quantum jumps. Amazing, isn't it? Hongu Mandel came at the same time, were able to manipulate single photons to make them collide on beam splitters. This is a beautiful quantum optics exercise, by the way and to observe a bunching due to their bosonic nature. And cavity QED, but that's something we will cover in much more detail. So people say it's beautiful, that's curiosity, but uh, atomic physics is dead again. No, in the 90, people started manipulating entanglements. We thought an atom one of the most subtle quantum resources. The fact that two particles that interact are a single quantum system. So it was, the famous exp aspect experiment on EPR test. It was the start of quantum cryptography, of quantum teleportation, the start towards the quantum internet. These are fancy words, but the, the key is that it's beautiful physics as well. People started to explore also the limits of quantum physics. Why is it that the microscopic world is quantum with superpositions? And why is it that the classical world is classical with no superpositions? This is due to decoherence, and it has started to being explored at the same time. And finally, it was the observation in 95 of a Bose-Einstein condensation, 
one of the most textbook examples of what quantum atomic physics can achieve. With all the atoms working the same pace. And okay, people said it's okay, but what then? But it goes on. Quantum physics keeps developing new things. Frequency comes, which have been a resolution is laser metrology, and which are instrumental in laser clocks. Attosecond physics. We do see papers now who measure times of 13 attoseconds with some precision. This is extraordinary. You can resolve the electron motion around the nucleus in the ground state of an atom. Think of it. Artificial system for quantum information, tailored atoms, man-made atoms that, are of course, are much more flexible. And, of course, all, we will discuss that in details, all the new phases of ultracon matter, atomic lattices, all this beautiful convergence of AMO and solid state. You know, for years, the solid state physicists have, to some extent, despised the AMO physicists because their systems were too simple. Only one atom, one photon, well, nothing matters. But then suddenly, with those systems like these lattices that will be discussed in the lecture, we can understand some key phenomena in um, in, in solid state physics. I think there is a striking thing. AMO physics has nothing to invite to the Moore's law, the famous law that says that computers get a factor of two in power in 18 months or so. In something like 50 years, well, a bit optimistic, 70 years, we have won something like nine or ten orders of magnitude on many things. On the clock precisions, a clock, a quartz clock, has a 10 minus 8 precision. We are now at 10 minus 18 precision in only 50 years. On the spectroscopic resolution, if you take the famous quest by Hench and Biraben of the hydrogen spectroscopy, they went from 10 to minus 5 to 10 to minus 15. On the ability to see an atom, in the 50s you could see 10 to the 10 atoms. It's about the number of atoms that fluoresce in a cell. Now we can routinely say, see one atom. On atomic temperatures, we were limited to 1K by standard cryogenic appliances. We are now sub nano Kelvin and even pico Kelvin. On laser pulse duration, the shortest laser when I was young were 10 picoseconds. We are now at 100 attoseconds, 10 or so of magnitude again. So you see, atomic physics has been thriving, and I hope that it will go on thriving, but you are there for that, of course. So the school is about interaction of light with cold atoms. So you just add the, the, suffix, the prefix cold to, to what has been said. And of course, this is very important. It's a key ingredient in modern AMO and quantum optics. And going acquainted with that is, of course, a prerequisite for research in this domain. I think also it's important to see that it's a paradigmatic example of fundamental quantum processes. Many things we will address in the school, I guess, are very much related to the very basic postulates of quantum physics and to the most intriguing things in quantum physics. So I think it's interesting too. And of course, and this is interesting for funding, it may lead to new applications. We could learn how to harness the quantum to perform new tasks for new states of matter, and the four pillars of quantum technology, quantum communication, how can we use the quantum to talk together, quantum computing, how can we use the quantum to compute. You might have seen this announcement of a 57 qubit computer by Google. Well, I don't like the way they do that, but that's another topic. It's a beautiful experiment. No, the, the, I don't like the way they announce that. Quantum simulation. And this is very much also at the heart of this school. How can we use quantum to understand the quantum? And quantum metrology, how can we use the quantum to measure better? For instance, to realize clocks. So this is the school, and I think uh, you should thank warmly the organizers, Mathilde, Philippe, Robin, Hélène, Gavin, for, for getting up the school together. I think they worked very hard for that. And I would like shortly to go through the program. 
Uh, this is the program as it appears. I would like just to, I've asked the, the, the people who will teach in the school to give me one, one slide and I will just present these slides. I've put them in an order which is perhaps not uh, this one. It's kind of more uh, uh, logically related. Uh, the, the first is Professor Baranov, and I'm sorry that I didn't receive your, your slide. Ah, it was not delivered to me, I'm sorry, it, it should have. Okay, okay, I'm, I'm, ver I'm very sorry. C could you just say two words about what, what you, or three, <laughs> or five, <laughs> even seven. <laughs> Thank you. And for the Italians, I want to mention that we have an artificial question. We have a very interesting artificial question. We have a collective motor in the Mona Camino. This was lined up there. Thank you very much, Mikhail. I'm sorry for the, for the confusion in the slide, but no, no, OK. Was too late. OK. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Philippe will cover the basic of laser cooling. Uh, well, uh, how does laser exert force on atoms? Basically, you will cover, Philippe, if I'm not mistaken, the effet lumino frigorique exactly. to some extent. So Doppler cooling, sub-Doppler cooling, and uh, beyond the simple mode. You, you want to add anything? No. Okay. <laughs> Ellen, uh, who is not there uh, yet, will cover the atomic lattices thing. It's a very, very uh, trendy topic. It's a very active topic. How can you sort atom in a kind of egg box? And what are the properties of these atoms? So she will go for the band structure in a periodic potential, so that will be very much solid state. Dynam dynamics in the lattice, block oscillation and the bose hubbard Hamiltonian mode transition. This is a beautiful example of a mode transition in Emmanuel's block experiment. Jörg Valraven will cover the field of ultra-cold collisions. What is the basic of the interactions that Professor Baranov will cover, to, we, will use for, for his lecture? So what is the relative motion of interactive particles? How do they interact? What are the potentials? What is the scattering? What is the diffusion length? What are all those parameters? that enter in so many cold atom experiments. Robin Kaiser will speak of disorder. It's always a trend in physics. You start by trying, fighting years and years to make something ordered, trying to make a beautiful laser that has narrow frequency width, that is very stable. And then, all of a sudden, you turn it into a chaotic system that is totally disordered, that has a huge bandwidth, that is totally garbagey, but interesting on the physical side. So it's the same for cold atoms. You can introduce disorder with speckled fields, for instance, and you can look how this disorder influences the dynamic of the atom, all the problem of interference, light scattering by cold atoms. That's very in interesting, of course. Anderson localization of light. How can you trap a photon <laughs> in a disordered medium? And there will be a lot of uh, MATLAB things. Anna Asenjo Garcia will cover collective phenomena in light matter interface. How can you use, for instance, a sheet of atoms to exchange photons cleverly between you? So she will cover atom light interaction, atom arrays as light matter interfaces, and atom atom interactions in unconventional bats. So I look forward to it. Antoine Brouwes, who is one of the world leaders in that field, will cover Rydberg atoms. Atoms interact, that's right. But if they interact for scattering lengths that are typically Youngstrom's or nanometers. Rydberg atoms are themselves many hundreds or thousands of nanometers across. 
So they interact very strongly. How can you harness these interactions to perform new things? For instance, in an Eiffel Tower 3D arrangement of atoms, many body physics with synthetic matters and quantum information processes. And Eckhart Pay will cover all the problem of high precision metrology and most, mostly optical clocks. How can we use trapped atoms and ions to measure the time? which is, of course, the quantity we best measure, as you know. Well, I have to measure the time as well. <laughs> OK, my lectures will be very introductory. No cold atoms, just atom-light interaction. We will, I will try to cover what is the interaction of a quantized field with a quantized atom. And of course, one of the first things in that is how do we quantize the field? How do we write the atom field interaction and what are the consequences? And I would like to illustrate that with a few notions of cavity quantum electrodynamics. How can we make an atom interact with a single cavity mode and exchange in a current way information and energy with this cavity mode? So these will be very basic lectures, mostly quantum optics lectures. But of course, field quantization is, is the same field quantization as will be derived for atoms, I guess. Uh, well, A and A dagger are, are universal. The commutation is not, but A and A dagger are universal. So th this will be just another approach. And of course, I've, uh, so this is a list of, of things you can read. There are on this link a very a quite comprehensive uh, written uh, notes of my lectures about 250 pages, something like that. So if you want to go there, I guess you receive the link to these slides, which you can use to take notes, of course, and, uh, and are free to use. There are, you might have noticed that there are many, 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 many slides. What we will cover in that uh, field will depend on you. The more questions we, you ask, the least we will cover. OK, so you just feel free. To ask questions, what is important is that you understand what I tell and not that I go to the end of what I could say. Basically, there is everything I know in this set of slides, <laughs> which is not a lot. OK. And there is this beautiful book. I might be one at the, at, at, the, at the library here, Exploring the Quantum, which contains most of the concepts. Once again, we've put with Serge everything we know in that. And you have many, many, many references therein because, of course, we are not the only ones to let atoms interact with light. So do you have any questions about all that? Any remarks? Oh, there is one major remark that I should make, is that I have two lectures today. Poor you. <laughs> <laughs> Poor me. OK, so I have to switch gears technically and to go to. Um, to another means of presentation. Oops. I don't want to go here. Affichage. There you go. It works. So th these are, th there are plenty of formulas, so you have to go to slide tech for that. Making formulas in PowerPoint is something to avoid. Definitely. OK, so let's start. There will be basically three parts in my, in my lectures. How do we quantize the field? How do we quantize the atom? OK, it's a spin one half, so no, not much to say on that. How do we quantize the atom? And how do, do the quantized atom interact with the field? Spontaneous emission, dressed atom picture. And finally, we will cover what we can cover of cavity QED concepts. So the first part is field quantization. How do we quantize the field, the electromagnetic field? So I'm sorry for those who have followed Hélène Perrin lectures last year at the M2 ICFP in Ecole Normale. There might be a strong feeling of déjà vu. Because I told the lecture before her, uh, there is a very strong overlap. So those can go playing cards or whatever. OK. Or just, just having a nap. For the others, I think, I, I hope it could be more useful. So we will cover three things, feed eigen modes, how do we quantize, define the Fox state, 
explore overfill quantum state, and we will also, because it's very relevant to cavity QED, explore the problem of relaxation. What happens if we cover, couple a field mode to an environment? How is the information lost? How is the entropy increasing? How is the energy flowing into the environment? And this would be a very uh, nice way to introduce some very basic things about general relaxation of quantum systems, Lindblad equation, jump operators, cross operators, Monte Carlo trajectories. I will just allude to all that, but it's very interesting. So how to quantize the field? This is, of course, a question that arose very, very early in the history of quantum physics, and the answer is simple. Just put it in a proper Hamiltonian classical frame, replace some x and some p that's by some operators whose commutator is i h bar, and turn the crank, and it will work. So the first thing in field quantization is just define the proper variables. And to define the proper variables, of course, it's not the field at any time, at any point, that is the proper variable. You need to expand this field on a proper basis. So finally, field quantization is all about classical electromagnetism. It doesn't mean that it's more, more easy. So we just need to find a basis to express the solution of the Maxwell's equation. I will only consider here three fields, so there is nothing but light in the universe. Okay. Uh, there is a beautiful sentence by Hélène de Generes. At the beginning, the God say, uh, let be light. There was light, you could see a world, there was nothing to see, but you could see it a world better. <laughs> but okay. So let, let's start. So I hope you, I, I know that you, uh, let, uh, that you are uh, very familiar with Maxwell's standard Maxwell equation. So I have an electric field at a point in time. This is non-covariant formulation, of course. And I can, at every point, define the Fourier transform of the electric field. I just want to simplify that a little bit because the Fourier transform is a priori a complex number, of course. But the electric field is a real number. I then can take part uh, benefit of that to, to, to simplify a little bit. I will define the positive frequency field as the part of the Fourier integral that goes over positive frequencies. And obviously, the field is the sum of the positive plus the negative part. The negative part being the sum from minus infinity to zero in the Fourier transform. And it's easy to realize that E minus is just E plus complex conjugate which I denote by a star. So they are not independent. So the only thing you need to quantize the field is to be able to express E plus. And if you have E plus, you add E minus. Very simple trick. Now we need a basis of modes. And for that, we need to set limiting conditions. If there are no limiting conditions, mathematicians will say you, it's a nightmare. There is nothing defined. So I take the universe. And I put it in a box, which is either a perfectly reflecting box or a box with periodic boundary conditions. I will assume the box to be rectangular with a volume V. This is, of course, a fictitious box. Uh, funding is not enough to allow us to wrap the universe in a big metallic box, uh, unfortunately. So it's a virtual box, and of course, we hope that everything that is related to this box, particularly its volume V, will get off the physical quantities by the end of the calculation. Or that we can get a proper limit for V goes to infinity. And if you go to mathematicians, they are sometimes useful, not often, but sometimes useful. They will tell you, if you have this box, then any solution of a Maxwell equation in free space can be expanded of a set of orthogonal functions which are the product of a space-dependent vector field, FL of R, times e to minus i omega LT. So harmonic functions, and FL being a kind of space envelope of a mode. And each of these things is denoted by a mode. And the L index, well, it's a complex index that enumerates the mode, but it's an enumerable set. So basically, you have as many modes as you have integers. FL obeys the Helmholtz equation. The FLs are orthogonal with respect to each other in the sense of complex functions. 
And there are normalized so that the integral over the volume of the box FL square is the volume of the box. Uh, this is a normalization condition that is not uh, pertinent when you have an actual box, and we will change it a little bit when we go to cavity QED, but it's only modification in the concept, not, not, in, uh, not important. And so what we will do is expand the positive part of the electric field, that is enough to define everything, onto the basis of a normal mode, with components EL of T that are manifestly harmonic functions of time. Okay? So at the end of the day, the positive part, positive frequency part of the electric field will be a sum of other modes of a field amplitude times an harmonic dependence with time times the mode function related to that. Is that okay? It's just technical. Of course, you might be more aware of the plane wave expansion. Plane wave expansion is just defining a simple basis for a rectangular box of size Lx, Ly, Az, and periodic boundaries. The modes are a set of plane waves with k vectors that are just multiples of a basic a periodicity 2 pi over Lx, 2 pi over Ly, 2 pi over Lz, it's reciprocal space. And for each set of the free integers nx, ny, and z, they should not be all zeros, of course. For each set of these integers, you have two orthogonal linear polarizations, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. Basically, you have kn for one mode, and epsilon 1, epsilon 2, two arbitrary vectors that define two orthogonal polarizations. So at the end of the day, fl is just the polarization times the plane wave, and that's it. And that, of course, gives back everything. And omega is just k, uh, c, c, k in modulus. Of course, you can choose also the polarization, circular polarization basis, sigma plus and sigma minus polarization. Around. So this is one of the examples of mode expansion, but you can think of very many. And in fact, you can change from one basis set to another through some unitary transforms. I don't want to get into the details. Now, that's okay. Feel free to interrupt. Or feel free to say this is all trivial and we all know that. Uh, okay. You choose. So now I need to define variables. If I want a good, a well put Hamiltonian approach to the problem, I need to define a Hamiltonian function h in terms of two quantities, x and p, which are Hamiltonian conjugate with respect to each other. So that dx over dt is dh over dp and, uh, and all that. So how do we do that? I will choose instead of a field, by the way, the vector potential. And we will do that in the very convenient Coulomb jauge. The Coulomb jauge is an awful gauge because, gauge because it's not a uh, Lorentz invariant. The Coulomb gauge is div of a is zero. And in this gauge, v is zero, and e is minus dA over dt. So it's a very simple gauge, gauge, and we will choose it. A and e is the same limiting condition, just because one is the derivative of the other. So you obey the same limiting conditions. So a can be expanded on the same set of modes as e. And you can define A plus, positive part of the vector potential, is the sum of amplitudes harmonically depending upon time, there is an L lacking there, sorry, times the same mode structure FL. Basically, it's just a matter of multiplying by omega, because okay, the derivative with time is simple. And so this harmonic dependency, AL of zero e to minus i omega LT, I will choose it to separate in a real part and an imaginary part. I will call x the real part. So x is the real part of the component on mod L of the potential vector. P is the imaginary part. x and p are real quantities. They both depend upon time, like a sine and a cosine, basically, or like a cosine, like a sine, because of this. And I just put here a random 
totally arbitrary normalization. Okay, well, it's kind of, you can start without that, turn the crank up to the Hamiltonian function, say O oh, the ugly factor, and get back and put it back in the beginning and redo the thing. That's a good exercise if you wish to check that it's this factor that normalizes properly the Hamiltonian at the end of the day. Note that XL and PL have a dimension. It's not dimensionless uh, things. They have a dimension that is the square root of an action. Aha! Square root of an action, so it means that x square is an action, x square is, is the dimension of h bar. It's not quantum, but we feel it could begin to be quantum in a moment. And so these are supposed to be our proper normal variables for the quantization of things. Okay? So with that, we can express all things. Because E plus is just the derivative of A plus with time, it's clear that the EL component is just I omega L A. And hence, we have E plus in terms of VAL, and VAL are in turn in terms of VXL and PL. So that's okay. What about the magnetic field? The magnetic field is the rot of A. B equals rot A. And so B is just sum of the L times a mode function HL that is the rot of a mode function FL. So when you have chosen the mode, you have a basis for E, and by taking the rot, you have a basis for B, basically. What about the energy? This is, of course, the expression of the energy. It's sum of E squared plus B squared. You have to write it in terms of real fields, because you don't put any complex there, I think, you know, beyond the stage. And if you make a little bit of algebra, you will understand that because of the orthogonality of the mode functions, FL, FM star is zero, integrated. H is just the sum of all modes of this quantity evaluated for each mode. H is just a sum of Hamiltonian functions for all modes. Okay? So yes? So the integration is over all modes? Over all space. Of all space. This, is, this integral we are not specifying is over the whole quantization box okay. of volume V. Of course, there is nothing, uh, nothing beyond the universe. There is nothing beyond the quantization box. So all integrals are finite. I, I take the pragmatic version of a physicist. I put a quantization box. I have no problems with normalizations. All integrals are finite. All integrals can be derived be, uh, be behind the sum. Everything is converging. Everything is infinitely derivable if I need so. Uh, I'm not a mathematician. But I know that if I go to a mathematician, they will give me the, 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 the right to do what I want to do, even if they have to invent the theory of distributions for that. OK? So let's write the energy of one mode. So I write E in terms of real quantities. And I find that E is with this normalization factor, X times the imaginary part of F plus P times the real part of F. Wherever I have a prime, it will denote a real part. Whenever I have a double prime, it will denote an imaginary part, just to save typing. Yeah. And so if I expand, I push, I pull, and I find that HE is omega over 2V, x squared times the integral of imaginary part of f squared plus p squared imaginary part. This is a square in the sense of vectors. These are vector fields. Plus 2xp f prime epsilon. Doesn't look like I would like. Of course, what I'm looking for is x squared plus p squared because it's the only possible Hamiltonian. There is nothing beyond harmonic oscillator. So I would like... Doesn't look like it. What about the magnetic energy? Do the same computation. I put B in terms of the real variables X and P. And of course, instead of F, I get H, which is the rot of F. And of course, H prime is the rot of F prime. H second, the rot of F second. I push, I pull, and I find the magnetic energy. It's awful. And it doesn't look at the same 
absolutely as the electric field energy. They are totally different. Oh, shit. Everybody says in the textbooks, it's clear that the magnetic field energy is equal to the, to the, to the electric field energy, whatever the circumstances, and they all sum up nicely. It's not evident. I will perhaps skip the, last, the next two pages of hard vector calculus. If you want to get through them, I encourage you. It's a beautiful exercise, very much in the French style. Utterly mathematics is the kind of thing that French students of second year find ecstatically interesting. You have to use this beautiful vector relation, which you all know by heart, of course. You have to push, you have to pull. You have to realize that H is the root of F. You have to realize that F is a solution of the Helmholtz equation, which is very important. So you go on pushing and pushing, and you get those relations. And those relations between the square products. Pushing and pushing again, you finally find. Okay, so this is violence, but uh, sometimes you need violence to make things go. H equals omega over 2, x squared plus p squared. Osanna, we got it. We get, for one mode, the Hamilton function of a one-dimensional harmonic oscillator, where x is the position and p the momentum. Well, a position that has the dimension of the square root of an action. So that this thing is finally an, a dimension that is H watt of an action times omega, and an action times omega is an energy. So at least for dimensionality, we are right. And this is a good thing, because if you take that, you find that dx over dt is dh over dp is omega p, which is what you expect between x and p have a real and imaginary part of an oscillating function at the mode frequency omega. And this is exactly what you need. So the, the equations of motions are right. X and P are canonically conjugate variables. The ones we need to perform field quantization. Okay? And that basically ends up the procedure. And now I just have to quantize and turn the crank. <coughs> okay? So the only difficulty was the violent vector analysis to, to show that the, the energy is sum correct. Of course, if you sum over the modes, you sum over the modes. Okay. Nothing to say. Uh, a thing that could be useful for the atomic cooling lectures of Philippe is the field momentum. Field carries energy, and hence fields carry momentum just because the photons have a momentum, because they have an energy and relativity is right. And so the, the density of momentum is the pointing vector divided by C squared. And in order to treat that, you have to choose properly the, the, the basis. The only good basis to express the momentum of a field is the plane wave basis. In all other basis, it's a nightmare. So you go to the plane wave basis, you expand E on the plane wave, you expand B on the plane wave, and of course, the, the rotational of a plane wave is very simple. It's just a vector multiply. You push, you pull, and after a long and painful calculation, no, it's really, the, okay, this step is, is two pages long, but okay, I leave it to you as an exercise for Sunday if it rains. Okay, instead of going in the mountains, I leave it to you. You get that the momentum is the sum of all modes, of the momentums of each mode, and that the momentums of each mode is the k of this mode, very nice, very neat, it should be, multiplied by the square of the amplitude of the field. So it looks like what you want. Anyway, the momentum is directed in the di direction of the plane wave modification. Okay, questions on that classical electromagnetism part? That's okay? A bit rapid? Well, it's very standard. Uh, and, and finally, it's not that which is most useful. You need to know that there are modes. You need to know that these modes are so beautifully orthogonal that the energy is just a sum over these modes. They can be treated independent, and that each of them is just a 1D harmonic oscillator. Of course, that was made in the very, in, in 27, very, very early days of, of quantum physics. 
while QED had to, to, to wait 20 more years to 46 Shelter Island Congress, is something that we will go in more details later. So now I just apply, apply the standard quantization procedure, which is take the Hamiltonian formation with, um, um, with com conjugate variables, replace them by operators acting in an infinitely dimensional Hilbert space, and let's replace X and P by operators, X and P, which have the right commutation relation. Turn the crank, your problem is quantized. Okay? Let's turn the crank. First, ah, one renormalization. Well, not renormalization, but when reduced unit choice. As I told you, X and P have a dimension of a square root of an action. So the operators of X and P have also a dimension, which is a square root of an action. And I don't like to operate with things that have a dimension. So I define X naught which is x over square root of 2 h bar, and p naught, which is p over square root of 2 h bar. And since I'm quantum, I can introduce h bar without, without change. I know that h bar should be there, everywhere. With this definition, the commutator is just high over 2. And this is the very standard procedure. I think you have all seen that in elementary uh, second semester lectures, Dirac quantization of the harmonic oscillator. Uh, I just page through it for, to, for, for the sake of definition. You define an annihilation operator, which is x naught plus i p naught. It's not Hermitian, it's conjugate is a dagger, x naught minus i p naught. So that x naught is a plus i dagger over 2, p naught is i, a dagger minus a over 2. And if you work out the commutation relation, a a da dagger equal 1. This is a bosonic commutation rule. I think we will hear a bit of fermionic commutation rules, of course, but photons are bosons, so I'm glad to operate with photons because it saves science. So A, A dagger equal one. So you rewrite in terms of A and dagger the classical energy. It was omega over 2 x square plus p square. So it's H bar omega with the renormalization x naught square plus p naught square. I write it in terms of VA and dagger. I expand and take care of the commutation relation. And I put the final result in what is called the normal order. Normal order is basically when you have a, a, a complex expression in A and A dagger, just use commutation to put all VA daggers on the left and all VAs on the right. We'll see many examples where it's useful. And I get H equals H bar omega, A dagger A plus one half. The plus one half will be the source of many, many worries later. But okay, that's the H. You all know that. I guess you all know that already. So you, come, you, you diagonize that. I don't want to get into the, the diagonization. If you want, refer to the Cohen uh, Tanuji Old Testament, the, the second volume of the, of, the, of the famous 73 textbook by Cohen Tanuji. Uh, there are many prints here, I guess. And, and all, all go back through that if you are not familiar with the uh, harmonic oscillator quantization. It's good to be familiar with it. Okay? So you define a number operator, a dagger a. So h is just h bar omega n plus one half. You can write the commutation relation of n with a, it's minus a, and n with a dagger, it's a dagger. It works out nice. And you can show that n as, as non-degenerate eigenvalues, all the integer numbers from zero to infinity. And the corresponding non-degenerate eigenstate, we call it the Fox state N. Be aware of the voyeur when you say Fox state. The Fox state N, so that NN is NN, which of course is not very demonstrative when you speak. And then the eigen energies are N plus one alpha H bar omega. And very clearly, you say that in state n, you have n quanta of energy h bar omega, or h nu, in addition to a vacuum energy of h bar. The vacuum zero, n equals zero, is the lowest eigenvalue. It's called the vacuum because there is no more energy than the minimum. And so the interpretation is simple. You are dealing with photons. 
And these photons are in number n in the Fox state n. Okay? And they have all the individual energy h bar omega or h nu. Back to 1905 field quantization by Einstein. Well, or 1900 field quantization by Planck, if you wish. So these Fox states are obviously orthogonal with respect to each other, just because they are a basis of an, of an emission operator. N is, basic, is, is, is clearly emission because it's H. If we compute the action of A on N, this is an intermediate step in the quantization, you will find square root of N and minus 1. So A within a factor, please remember the factor, it's important for something. Within a factor, A is transforming the Fox state into the Fox state N minus 1. It's taking an N photon state into an N minus 1 photon state. So basically, it's destroying a photon. It's what it's called, not the destroying operator, but the annihilation operator. It annihilates a photon. And of course, if you are in the vacuum, there is nothing to annihilate. So when you act the annihilation operator on the vacuum, you find a zero length vector. Be aware of the notations here, of course, the zero here is the number of photons inside the ket. V0 is the zero of Hilbert space. The zero length vector. Similarly, A dagger N is square root of N plus 1, N plus 1. It creates a photon in the state N. It's what he calls the creation operator. And it's easy from this relation to rewrite that the commutation is A dagger A equal one. There, you can go to infinity. You can have as many photons as you wish. Of course, there you are limited by the fact. It means that the Fox state N can be reached by repetitive stepwise creations of photons from the vacuum. If you want to go to 10, you go to 1, to 2, to 3, to 4, to 10. And so to create N, you have to act A dagger N times on the vacuum. And you have, of course, to take into account that that is normalized, that is normalized, that should be normalized. Because of this, you have a square root of factorial n in the denominator. If you want to remember well wh wh where is the square root of n and when is the square root of n plus 1, just observe that in this relation, what is under the square root is the largest n in the ket. Here you have n and n minus 1 is square root of n, n and n plus 1 is square root of n plus 1. It's how I remember it. Okay? Of course, the Fox states are a basis of a whole Hilbert space. So every field state, I'm here dealing, I, I, did I say that, but I'm dealing with a single mode for the time being, <laughs> from the start. Okay, the sum over L is over, I have only a single mode. Okay, uh, I might have forgotten to say this essential thing. So a pure state of this single mode can be expanded on the Fox state basis. The probability for having n photons in that state is obviously the modulus square of Cn square. It's called the photon number distribution. You can define, of course, in that state, the mean photon number, which is just well, the mean of the photon number distribution. The P of n, the probability for having n photon, and the variance, which is thus the variance of a photon number distribution. Of course, we are no uh, naive. We know that we are not limited to pure states. We can think of statistical mixture of field states in one given mode. You are all familiar with the density operator formalism? All of you? No? Okay. So, Rho, in this case, is just a sum over n and p. Rho and p, the cross projector and p. And the photon number distribution is, a, if you think of rho as an infinite matrix, the photon number distribution is along the diagonal of this infinite matrix. Of course, the Hilbert space is infinitely dimensional. This entails some mathematical problems. If you are not comfortable with mathematical problems, the energy of a non-universe is finite. We have 10 to the 80 particles. 
So each one with a one chev energy. So all together, you cannot put in any mode more than the number of photons that correspond to the energy of the universe. So you have a finite cutoff, and you can live with this cutoff. But in practical experiments, the cutoff is much, much, much lower, of course. Questions? No? No questions? You all knew that before. Okay, so just a, a way to... to to get acquainted, to, to restart your brain. You can, of course, define wave functions if you wish, because the harmonic oscillator behind has a momentum and a position. So you can define a position basis, which are the eigenstate of a position operator x naught, a momentum basis. You have to cope with the fact that these operators are not well defined because all everything is diverging, and uh, okay, we don't care. They are not mathematicians, they will care for us. So you can define a wave function for any state psi, which is psi projected of the position state x. And if you compute the wave function of a vacuum, it's just a Gaussian centered at the origin. And since the wave function for the momentum is the Fourier transform of the wave function for the position, and since the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is the same Gaussian, you have as well a peer representation, this is the expression of the wave function of a vacuum. So how, how oh yes? So the position and momentum theory is, um, it's not a position of momentum in real space. It's not a, p no, okay, I, I, I would mention that. This pertains to the quantum description of a single mode in the field. Mm -hmm. And the x and p's are not real position and momenta, mm -hmm. they are the real and imaginary part, basically of a vector potential. Okay? So they don't belong to real space. Okay. Suffice it to say that their dimension is the square root of an action. Mm -hmm. They are not meters and, and kilogram meters per second. Okay, so these are not, we, we live, this harmonic oscillator lives in an abstract space that is not directly related to physical space. The link between the abstract space and the physical space is the mode wave function FL. And that, that question allows me to enter into a problem. What is finally a photon? This is an interesting question. A photon is the least excitation that you could put in a mode of the electromagnetic field. So a photon is a quantum h nu, or h bar omega, of energy which exists in a classical electromagnetic field mode. It's something that is either a plane wave in real space, or I don't know, in a laser cavity, a Gaussian mode, a Gaussian standing wave. So a photon is one excitation there. So a photon has no wave function, no position to speak of, but it inhabits a mode whose polarization, whose space dependence are all defined by the mode function FL. Is that clear? So basically a photon is non-local. So to speak, a photon is non-local. Well, after that, uh, okay. You would like to take uh, care of describing how you can make correlation experiments on the two points of the universe on the same photon. Okay, D don't get into that. But in this simple picture, a photon is just the elementary excitation of a classical electromagnetic field mode. And everything that is polarization, space dependence of a photon is embedded in the classical solution, in the FL, in the mode structure. Yeah, 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 because we will take the value, basically, we'll get into that. that that's all, all next lecture, basically. But what we will do is take the value of electric field where the atom sits, mm -hmm. and this value will contain the value of FL where the atom sits, and will contain operator in Hilbert space, which will be A and A dagger. Mm -hmm. And at the end, we, the, the, the interaction will be a constant that includes the FL times combination of A, A and A dagger. But we will go into that in, 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 in a lot of detail later. But okay, space is classical for the photon, so to speak. Is that clear? Okay, so it suggests, this suggests a, a beautiful pictorial interpretation of a, of, of, of a, of a vacuum set. Le, let's plot a phase space. The phase space for an is the space X and P. Or X not and P not, okay, uh, whatever. So the vacuum state is a kind of Gaussian blob 
symmetrical center at the origin. And that, of course, leads to the vacuum fluctuations interpretation. The vacuum state is not a state in which the electric field is strictly zero. Classically, the vacuum state is x equal p equal zero. Here, because of the quantum, because we have to respect the commutation rules, the field in the vacuum is not zero. There are fluctuations of x and p, or e and b, or a and p, or whatever operators of the field around the zero value. So this starts being very non-classical. Okay? Well, for the Fox state n, okay, this is the expression of the wave function. It has n nodes and a parity minus 1 to the n. And it's a bit awful. There is a Hermit polynomial. Okay, that's maths. Forget about it. Well, of course, this was done for one mode. If you want to go into all the modes, you have to define a Fock basis for each mode, make the tensor product of this infinity of infinite dimensional Hilbert space, don't care with the math, it will work out. Say that uh, you have an energy, that is the sum of the energies of the mode. So with this difficulty, sum over h, the h bar omega over 2 is clearly infinite, because you have an infinite number of modes and going to infinity, forget about that. And the complex Fock state, N1 and L, is a dagger to the L and L over square root of L, zero. You just generalize, put the index L back, and sum of our modes. Okay, this is it. Uh, of course, you can have different mode representation. For instance, you can have a photon in one mode, which is the superposition of a photon being either in this over mode or in this over mode when you make a, a mode basis change, but we won't come into it. What about the other operators? A priori, replacing x and p by operators, I should replace all the fields and quantity pertaining to the field by operators acting in the field in the space. And the substitution is simple. From the classical amplitude of the harmonic of the vector potential, xl plus epl times this normalization, I go to the operators. I recognize here within a normalization XL naught plus IPL naught, which is AL. And so I find this relation, AL operator, is just the annihilation operator. I go back to the expression of A plus of R, which is just, there is no, I mean the Schrodinger picture, so there is no time, explicit time dependency of the operators. And A plus of R is just the sum of our modes of a normalization time L time FL. So you know all the classical electromagnetism, all the geometry, all the polarization of a mode is embedded in this vector quantity FL, which is classical, and everything that is operatorial is just encapsulated in AL. So real space, Hilbert space, and they are well separated, which is neat to work with. And at the end, you have the Hermitian vector potential operator, which is just this complex expression. You can do it for the electric field. You have a factor h, uh, h bar, you have a factor omega due to the derivation. E is minus dA over dt. So there is an A omega coming out. So you have A, LFL minus LA dagger FL star, which is obviously Hermitian. There is an I there not to be forgotten. And the normalization here is that we will call the field per photon, square root h bar omega l over 2 epsilon 0 v. This you can find very easily by saying that in the mode volume v, the box volume v, you have an energy h bar omega. It just gives you the field amplitude. Yes. And b is that. It's also a combination of al and al dagger. And the only difference is in the space operators, we take the rot of a mode function. And you can get to P. So, for instance, in the plane wave mode basis, A plus is that, uh, A plus, okay. Uh, but just rewriting and substituting and pushing, pulling. Uh, uh, and P, for instance, this is neat, I think, for many lectures on atomic cooling. You find that the mode, moment, that the field momentum operator 
is the sum over of modes. H bar KL, which is obviously the momentum of one photon in mode L, plane wave mode L, times the number of photon in this mode, which says again that each photon carries a momentum h bar omega in the di h bar k in the direction of a plane wave propagation. Neat, isn't it? But it couldn't be as well. Finally, I was in the Schrodinger picture. You can switch to the Eisenberg picture. And in the Eisenberg picture, you will get that the annihilation operator A evolves as an harmonic function of time, just as the classical field amplitude did. So the loop, the loop is there, everything works. Okay? Is that clear? Not fed up? Ready for one more quarter of an hour on the topic? Okay, no questions? Feel free to ask. Uh, uh, the, the interest is in asking questions, particularly those I can answer. Yeah? It's verified because the, the vacuum, take the vacuum state, it, it's just the ground state of my Hamiltonian. It has energy h bar omega over 2. It's just all the Fox states are stationary states of the Hamiltonian, and so the energy conservation is just built in in the mere definition of those states. How energy is conserved when you interact with an atom is something that we will uh, address a bit more precisely later. But basically, it's that. Just you have an Hamiltonian, you have uh, what is called uh, uh, ah, stationary state. Okay. But I don't like Fox states. Why? Think of Fox state N. It has obviously a large energy. Take N to be zillions, it has an energy of zillion joules. The Fox state N has a large energy, but it's clear that the average value of the electric field operator in the Fox state N is zero. Why is that? Because this is a combination of A and A dagger with normalizations, with mode functions, with plenty of garbage. And it's clear that N A N is zero because A N is the square root of N minus one square root of n and n minus 1, and n and n minus 1 is 0. So a Fox state has a very large energy, but no electric field. A Fox state has a very large energy, but no magnetic field. A Fox state has a very large energy, no, it has a momentum. The only thing it has is a momentum. So it doesn't look as the states I'm used to man manipulate. This field here has an energy, but it has also a phase, a well-defined classical amplitude, a well-defined electric field. If I had a very fast diode and could put it, or if I modified this laser beam, I would get a beautiful sign versus time that reveals that this beam is oscillating at one given frequency. Well, this is a bit optimistic vision of a laser pointer uh, ba bandwidth, but okay, you understand the picture. If I plug a Fox state on the scope, I see nothing. And when I plug a scope on a, on, a, on a synthesizer, I see a sign. How can we recover the sign? Yes? So if I had an electric field and would try to express it with Fox states, I would just fail. No, you don't fail. Fox states are a basis. What I just say is that in one Fox state, the average of the electric field is zero, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean that there is not an electric field operator. The average of a square of electric field, which is the energy, is non-zero. Okay? Yes? It also means that if you plug it in time, you will actually see something. Hmm? You will not see a sign wave, but you will see something. You will see noise. Yeah. You will see random noise. Yeah. That's right. Well, m more on the later and more on, on that later. But uh, you, you will see. If you homodyne a Fox state, you will see a random field, basically. But no average value. And it's not very classical. It's not the vision I have of a field at frequency omega. And so the only question, all that is just small talk, to introduce the real question, can we define 
some more classical states of the radiation. And this is, of course, something that you have been exposed to. It's coherent state, Glauber coherent state. And so how do we define that? Uh, we define displacement operator, D of alpha, that depends upon a complex, or an arbitrary complex amplitude alpha, and which is just this exponential, alpha e dagger minus alpha star a. And of course, this exponential, uh, you cannot simplify it as uh, the product of the exponentials, because a and a dagger are done commuting, so we will have plenty of problems with that. So alpha is a complex amplitude with a real and an imaginary part. This is obviously a unitary, because d dagger d is 1. And by the way, it's easy to show that d alpha dagger is d of minus alpha. Why does it displace? That is the question. So let's write it in terms of x and p. The reduced operator x0 and p0. So this is what you get. And of course, this is an exponential of a sum. And the exponential of a sum is not the product of the exponentials, but in a simple case, you can use what is called Glauber relation, which is in fact glauber sudarshan relation, and which in fact was invented by mathematicians far before Glauber and Sudarshan. It's e to the a, e to the b, is e to the a plus b times e to the commutator of e and b over 2, which is valid only if a and b both commute with their commutator. This is a useful relation, indeed. Hard to remember, but useful. So here it's OK, because A is x naught, B is p naught within factors. x naught p naught has a constant commutator. It's just a number. And a number commutes with any operator. So this is OK. And so I can work out D of alpha is the exponential of a commutator times the exponential of x naught, times the exponential of p naught. OK? Now, what's that? e to the minus something p. It's called the translation operator. It's what generates the translation operation, because if you apply that to the x position, position in terms of my abstract Hilbert space of one mode, if I apply this operator onto x, I find x plus alpha prime. So this is a translation in position space by a quantity that is the real part of the amplitude alpha. It's easy to see that this is a transition in the momentum space by a quantity that is the imaginary part of alpha. So what D is doing, basically, is taking you in phase space translating along the x-axis by the real part of alpha, and translating, I, we have difficulties to go very far, but translating in the y-axis by the imaginary part of alpha. So basically, D is an operator that takes you in the, that takes the bare space and translates it by the complex quantity alpha. It's why it's called a displacement operator. And you can see that even more easily. Let's compute d alpha d beta. What is translating by beta first and translating by alpha next? So I'm sorry, the, the picture is not correct. Uh, you should exchange alpha and beta. OK, sorry for that. Uh, you, you just work out it using the Glauber uh, relation once more for the whole of what is in the exponential. And you get that d alpha d beta is basically d alpha plus beta times a phase. Because this is the exponential of an imaginary number, and it's purely a phase. And a phase is kind of irrelevant in quantum physics, well, for, for one given state, of course. So basically, if you translate by alpha and then translate by beta, or if you translate by beta and then translate by alpha, it's within a phase equivalent to translating by alpha plus beta. It works fine. And finally, it looks very much in the Fresnel. If we think of the phase space here as the Fresnel plane of standard uh, electricity, it's just adding an amplitude to a field. 
Note that the phase here is the, the surface of this triangle, and it's one of the very many examples of a topological phase. It's not dynamical, it's topological phase. Okay, how do we translate the initial operator? We'll need that. Just an exercise. If you love quantum optics, just redo the exercises. They are simple enough. You have to compute d of minus alpha a d of alpha just to see how d acts on an operator. And for that, we will use the Baker-Hausdorff lemma. It's another beautiful thing of quantum optics. e to the a, a e to the minus a is a plus commutator of a with a plus 1 over factorial 2 double commutator plus 1 over factorial 3 triple commutator and so on and so forth. A formula that is of course of little use if the series is infinite. But you might be lucky if we take here a is basically the, the log of the displacement operator. You observe that its commutator with a is a constant and so the hierarchy stops there. So you can use it, and you find that d sandwiching a, well, it's not lunchtime yet, d sandwiching a just translates a by alpha times the unity operator in the advanced phase. Once more, it's a translation operator by alpha. And that leads to the definition of current states. The current states are the vacuum translated by the displacement operator alpha. So that an infinite family of states defined by a complex amplitude. So there are, so to speak, many more current states than Fox states, because the Fox states are uh, Aleph zero, that's what it's called, the, 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 the number of integers, whereas the current states are Aleph one, the number of the continuum. So there are many more, but don't care with that. The vacuum is a current state because it's a current state with a zero displacement because d of zero is unity, I should have said it. And with the displacement in mind, the current state in the X representation is a Gaussian centered at the real part of alpha. In P representation, a Gaussian centered at the imaginary part of alpha. And here comes the current state picture a current state is nothing but a classical amplitude alpha living in the Fresnel plane. Just, you know, a classical electromagnetic field with uh, two quadratures living in the plane. And on top of that, it's the vacuum translated by this amplitude. So on top of that, you have a Gaussian with a radius one, which reflects the remaining field fluctuations. And then you get the picture. The vacuum state is very non-classical because it's all made of fluctuations. It's a current state centered on the origin. Imagine that I take the current state and displayed by one. It's very much non-classical as well. The quantum fluctuations are still of the order of the main amplitude. But imagine now that I take the current state with one zillion photon. This is the uncertainty disk. This is the amplitude. This looks very much like a classical field. The quantum fluctuations are totally negligible as compared to the classical amplitude of the field. If I plug that on a scope, I see nothing or I see noise. If I plug that, I see mainly noise with perhaps a hint of a vague oscillation, and I put that on a scope, I get what you get in lab classes when you put a generator on a scope. I get a sign. Yeah? So with the displacement operator, is it like a, a thing where, you, where somebody said to themselves, I want to shift the state around in the, in the yeah. phase space, and that's why I define the operator like that, yeah. and work backwards? Uh, the, the the like a, oh, that's no, the operator, let's see what that does. No, there, there is another approach that is complementary to that. that. That is a bit artificial because I, I start with a displacement operator and I take you to swallow this displacement operator, kind of difficult, and then I tell you, oh, oh, by the way, it's fantastic because I get classical state. There is another approach, which is to say, what do we need for a state to be classical? From that, you need, you deduce a uh, something that I will go on in two minutes, 
just for the sake of, of the end of the demonstration, and then you understand that you should displace, and then you display, define the displacement operator. So my approach might not have been the most pedagogical one. Yeah, that's right. And the key is that current states are right eigenstates of the annihilation operator. A alpha is alpha alpha. The eigenvalue is complex. OK, A is not a Hermitian operator. It has eigen complex eigenvalues. And that derives from this beautiful chain. Alpha is the alpha 0. There, just for decoration, you can add the unity, the alpha d minus alpha. You use the translation operator acting on A. You just translate I, and you get that. A acting on 0 is 0. So it remains alpha acting on 0, which is alpha 0. The alpha propagates out, and you get alpha alpha. So the current states are eigenstates of a displacement operator. It means that alpha A alpha is just alpha. It means that the electric field has a non-zero average in a current state. And a non-zero average that is just the classical field that would go with a normalized amplitude alpha. And it means that if you plug that on the scope, you will see a sign. OK? So the right, if, if you ever teach that, an approach would be to say, I want that. So I need that. So I need that. And I invent the displacement operator. OK? So I think it's almost it for the current states. But perhaps it's time to stop. I will allude to their properties in the next talk. So a final question or two? No questions whatsoever. They are dead. <laughs> <laughs> OK. By the way, I will be around the school most of the school duration. So if you have questions, if you want to, to, to do exercises, if you want to, to get in the hairy details, uh, I will be there to help. And. Uh, Anyway, uh, Ellen would be equally qualified to help you with this lecture.